In December's Chronic Disease Spotlight, we're talking about a condition which has shown significant upward trend over the past two decades. And in many cases, no cause can be determined. Symptoms include pain, burning, numbness and tingling, with people often reporting feeling like they're wearing a stocking or a glove over the affected limb. And it typically starts in the feet and ascends upward. So what are we talking about here? This way for small fiber neuropathy. Hope you all had a wonderful Turkey Day and a kickoff to the holiday season 2022. And for returning viewers and new subscribers, I wanna tell you I am immensely thankful for every single one of you. So, small fiber neuropathy. And for the rest of the video, I'll refer to it periodically as SFN. So some of you may be saying, I've heard of peripheral neuropathy, so is small fiber somehow related? And if so, what's the difference between the two? So I'm gonna clarify that right up front. Small fiber neuropathy is actually a type of peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral neuropathy is a prevalent problem, which causes the same symptoms as small fiber namely burning, numbness, tingling, and pain, changes in temperature, sensation, etc. But the nerves causing this are different. They are smaller. Peripheral neuropathy affects the peripheral nerves. So in simple terms, it affects all of the nerves in the extremities with the exception of the brain and spinal cord. These are peripheral, meaning the nerves in our hands, feet, legs, arms, and even the trunk of our body. Small fiber nerves are peripheral nerves. However, these specifically involve fibers which are either thinly myelinated or do not have myelin at all. And myelin, in case you're wondering, is the fatty covering on most nerves, which helps impulses travel quickly from point A to point B. It's kind of just like a plastic covering on an electrical wire. Without that covering, the impulses tend to stutter and arc and it's just not cute. So myelin kind of serves the same purpose. And if you'd like a more in-depth overview on peripheral neuropathy and myelin sheaths, then check out our peripheral neuropathy video right here or here. I'm never sure which one. Anyway, Within the group of small fiber nerves are A delta fibers, which are the thinly myelinated nerves, and C nerve fibers, which do not have myelin at all. These nerves are so tiny that there's really no place for the myelin to rest. So these nerves tend to transmit much slower impulses than those that do have myelin. These are like the little old grannies of the peripheral nervous system, if you will. Now, our nerves as a whole have different functions in general, and the peripheral nerves have three main functions. Motor function, causing our muscles to move. Sensory function, as just mentioned, affecting temperature, touch, etc. And autonomic function, which transmits cardiovascular impulses, gastrointestinal, and pseudomotor impulses which controls sweating as well as impulses to the urinary and genital systems. Now, keeping that in mind, small fiber neuropathy may affect both sensory, again, temperature and touch, and autonomic function, but not motor. Since these are small fiber nerves, they aren't responsible for communicating balance information to the brain or the motor nerve fibers that control muscles. So that means that these people that have small fiber do not typically experience balance issues or muscle weakness. So what are some of the most common causes and diseases linked to small fiber neuropathy? Conditions associated with this type of neuropathy can be broken down into six categories. Hereditary, including Fabry's disease, Wilson's disease, and amyloidosis. Immune-mediated, which includes Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, fibromyalgia, lupus, sarcoidosis, and arthritis. Toxic, which is alcohol use, chemotherapy, vaccine-related, and neurotoxic drugs. 
infectious, which includes Lyme's, HIV, and hepatitis C. Metabolic, which is diabetes, vitamin B12 deficiency, and thyroid issues. And then finally, idiopathic, which simply means that we have no clue as to what's causing this. So you can see that there are numerous potential causes for small fiber, and sometimes its causes don't correlate with anything. So to diagnose this condition, there are several methods that your doctor or NP will use, and it starts with thorough history and physical exam. This is crucial because while small fiber usually presents in a length dependent pattern, meaning symptoms begin in the feet and advance upwards, this is not always the case, and it can also start as either a diffuse kind of patchy distribution involving different body parts, including the mouth, face, trunk, scalp, or upper limbs, or it can also have an unequal presentation, meaning it's not following any expected pattern. Some can have burning mouth syndrome, vulvodynia, or notalgia parasthetica, which has symptoms of skin itching, tenderness, burning pain, and sensitivity. And it usually occurs to one side and occurs on the mid to upper back most often. There's also usually a discoloring of the skin over the affected area. Next is diagnostic testing, and there is a whole slew of tests that can be done. Namely, a skin biopsy is often used to diagnose small fiber, and it's a minimally invasive procedure involving skin specimens, which are typically obtained by a tiny three millimeter punch biopsy at the lower leg or thigh, and are then sent to the lab for analysis. This basically shows how thick and healthy the small nerve fibers are, and can shed light on whether there's a potential issue with those small nerves. So in addition to these two tests is the QSART, which is a non-invasive study used to look at the volume of sweat produced in the limbs in response to acetylcholine, which tells us basically whether there is an issue with the autonomic function in those nerves. Now, recall, autonomic function transmits cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and pseudomotor impulses, which control sweating, heart function, and stomach and intestine function, amongst others. Additional useful diagnostic tests may include a tilt table test for patients with palpitations and blood pressure issues. Often someone with autonomic small fiber involvement can also experience something called orthostatic hypotension, which is just a fancy way of saying that when they stand up too quickly, they get lightheaded and sometimes can even pass out. So a tilt table test attempts to determine the cause of the fainting by creating changes in your posture from lying to standing. You'll lie flat on a special bed with special safety belts and a footrest while connected to an ECG or electrocardiogram and blood pressure monitors. Kind of sounds like Frankenstein. Remember that scene from Frankenstein where they're like, That's what it's reminding me of. Anyway, connected to blood pressure monitors, and then the bed is then elevated to an almost standing position to simulate standing up from lying position. And if the test causes you to faint, then the table will be returned quickly to a flat position to help you regain consciousness. The diagnosis of small fiber remains difficult as there's not yet an available gold standard test. But while some sources have suggested that the presence of at least two abnormal findings are enough to make this call, it's still kind of, uh, it can be an elusive diagnosis. Very often it's mistaken for run of the mill peripheral neuropathy, which in a way, if I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid and listening to my own explanation would be accurate, but there is a very fine distinction between small fiber and peripheral neuropathy. Other tests include a very long list of blood samples to not only illuminate certain values which are indicative of small fiber, but to also rule out other potential underlying causes that could be the cause of your symptoms. Some of these include vitamin deficiency testing such as B6 and B12, glucose tolerance testing, HIV and hep C testing, copper levels, 
protein levels, and genetic testing if that's a suspected cause. Okay, so that was an overview of the testing that you may have to make the diagnosis. But now let's get into some of the management if you have actually been diagnosed with small fiber. So right out of the starting gate, management of small fiber should involve treatment of the underlying cause, of course. Diabetes should be managed not only with blood sugar and lipid lowering agents, but also with lifestyle modifications focusing specifically on nutrition and exercise. Sorry, sorry for all those out there that, uh, you know, you were hoping I had a different magic bullet, but I am probably preaching what, what your doctor has been saying to you. You need to eat right and exercise, you know. The, the best treatment for small fiber, as you'll see as I continue, is to really just treat the underlying issue. Now, I know that walking and running and exercise may be difficult for somebody with small fiber because you're in pain. So alternative exercises like swimming or water aerobics or stationary cycling can be pursued. Now, in cases of vitamin B12 deficiency, injections rather than oral supplementation are often recommended as this deficiency is more often due to poor absorption rather than poor dietary intake. In the case of painful small fiber and dysautonomia, and dysautonomia is just another, yet another, fancy medical term for malfunction of the autonomic nervous system. So in the case of painful small fiber and dysautonomia secondary to Sjogren's syndrome, it's usually treated successfully with steroids IVIG or immunoglobulins and immunosuppressants. Small fiber associated with sarcoidosis may also be treated with IVIG or rituxan or a combination of the two. And patients with small fiber secondary to celiac disease may find relief with a gluten-free diet. So all of these are pretty straightforward solutions that address the underlying causes with the exception of maybe the IVIG, the rituxan, and steroids, which honestly have been shown to be very, very beneficial in the treatment of small fiber. The only issue with steroids is yes, they do work well, but you really don't want to stay on them for very long because then they kind of lead to other, other potential issues, which we don't want. So, you know, steroids definitely have their place as do all of the medications that I'm talking about here for the treatment of small fiber. But, you know, true discretion needs to be used here. Pain management is next and is so very, very important with this treatment regime as you know, this type of pain may be debilitating and lead to depression if it's ongoing for any length of time. So pain is often best managed with a team approach. So it may involve a primary care physician, a pain management specialist, a neurologist, and, and also a psychiatrist. Medications used in the treatment of small fiber, aside from those already mentioned, include anticonvulsants, antidepressants, topical anesthetics, narcotics, non-narcotic analgesics like Advil and naproxen, and antiarrhythmics, while non-pharmacological treatments such as heat, ice, massage of painful areas, and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation units or TENS units. And if you wanna know more about TENS units, I can do another video if I get enough comments about that, so drop them below if you want me to go into greater detail about TENS units. So anticonvulsant medications are also in this arsenal and include gabapentin and pregabalin, tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline and nortriptyline, semi-synthetic opioids including tramadol and 5% topical lidocaine patches. So these medications can be used either alone or in combination non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac may also be used. However, they are often less effective 
than the previously mentioned drug. And then rounding out this list is also medical marijuana, which has been shown to have really a lot of benefits with diabetic related small fiber neuropathy and HIV mediated causes. Next, we're gonna talk about neuromodulation, which refers to a variety of surgical procedures where we insert technology that acts directly upon the nerves and alters or modulates activity by delivering electrical or pharmaceutical agents directly to a targeted area. This has proven very effective in treating the painful symptoms of small fiber. So as you can see, there is quite a bit to understand with this chronic condition, and we've really only just scratched the surface, unfortunately. So to everyone watching who's been diagnosed with small fiber, I completely understand what you're going through as far as trying to manage the pain in some capacity. If you'd like to leave a comment or have a question, please drop them below. And if you found benefit with this video, please like, subscribe, and share it as it really, really helps the channel. And the YouTube gods like this too, which helps others find the information. With that, I will see you Sunday.